Welcome to the Mutual Knowledge Podcast. I'm here with Rob Vander Veer, and he is Senior Principal at SIG. Rob, if you want to introduce yourself, um, tell us about a few of the projects you've been leading. <laughs> Thank you. It's great to be here, Zoe. Uh, so yes, I'm Rob. I uh, live just above Amsterdam in the Netherlands. I work for Software Improvement Group now for 12 years. I am from the AI software industry, where I begin, uh, began in the beginning of the 90s uh, as a data scientist, a programmer, a hacker, a CTO, a CEO for many years, and then I became a consultant. Now I help clients all around the world uh, with AI, security, and privacy, mostly. And I contribute to OWASP, uh, to OWASP SAM. Uh, we founded uh, OpenCRE, dot org which brings together all kinds of security standards into one resource and uh, the OWASP AI security and privacy guide which also contains the AI exchange in which we gather um, yeah AI security experts all around the world trying to open source that whole discussion feeding into important new standards by ISO uh, and for the uh, AI act so uh, and, and these days AI is so hot I was doing it long before it was cool. So now it's uh, yeah time to make up for that. It almost feels like that. Wonderful. Yeah, I mean, cheers to those of us doing things before they're cool because we're actually passionate and interesting. <laughs> um, so I know that you've been working on many projects that bring together various areas of expertise and various standards, as you've mentioned. So specifically for the AI security and privacy guide, what inspired you to combine AI security and AI privacy in the same guide? Yeah, good question. Uh, there, there is so much overlap already for you know, software systems when it comes to security and privacy. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to draw a line. Um, and especially with AI, there are so many things involved that it is essential, I think, for engineers and for security professionals to know about both aspects. And it's more efficient and more clear to treat them just as you know one topic and try to cover it all. Well said, well said. Yeah, it really does um, overlap, um, kind of always has, it's not specific to AI systems that it's been an overlap. Um, yeah, well said. Um, the privacy by design principles, speaking of privacy engineers. So similar principles such as minimization and storage limits are really important in designing any system securely and with privacy in mind. So. What are some ways in which impl implementation of these techniques are unique when it comes to AI systems versus other systems? Yeah, data minimization, uh, you mentioned that as an example of a principle, is of course uh, a privacy principle, but at the same time, it's a security principle, right? I mean, even if it's not personal data, you want to minimize uh, what data you collect if it's sensitive, if it's company secrets, for example. Uh, you also want to minimize where you send it to, and you want to minimize um, uh, the time that you that you keep it. So these principles apply uh, to uh, IT security in general, and in particular for AI systems, this principle is important because AI is data intensive. So we're dealing with personal data uh, in many cases with AI systems and um, minimizing them is super important because the attack service is very big. In normal systems, we're dealing with personal data that are in the system in production if the system is live. With AI, we're also dealing with personal data in the engineering environment. Data scientists need to work with real data. This is different from conventional systems. And because they work with real data, we need to take all kinds of countermeasures in the development environment by segregating, by access control, by you know, proper encryption, uh, much more than we normally need to do in engineering environments. So data minimization has a larger uh, 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 surface area, if you will, when it comes to uh, AI systems. 
And because we're mostly talking about training data uh, when it comes to uh, personal data and AI systems, there's a couple of uh, tricks that you can apply uh, that in many other systems you cannot. For example, um, in machine learning, uh, you're not really interested in the identity of the individuals of which you have the data. If you remove that identity, identity data, like name and address and social security number, the remaining data can often still be used to identify an individual. Then the trick becomes, if you want to make, uh, make sure that the system is privacy preserving, you need to alter that remaining data to make it unrecognizable. And completely unrecognizable is often impossible, but the level of uh, difficulty that uh, is necessary for re-identification, you need to make that as you know, so big as possible. And um, uh, this is, uh, th there are different techniques uh, for that. Uh, this sort of domain is called differential privacy. You can add noise to data. Uh, you can aggregate data in order to make it unrecognizable, unrecognizable because you're interested in the patterns in the personal data and not in the individuals themselves. So that's what's very typical for machine learning uh, systems with personal data. Another typical thing is that uh, if you collect uh, personal data in different places, uh, you can train models in those different places uh, and then integrate them into one super model. And those different places where you train, you can sort of have the personal data separated, thereby reducing the risk of uh, leaking all the, all the data at the same time. This is called federated learning. It is not a silver bullet uh, because there is also additional attack surface there. But in many situations, especially where data collection is distributed, uh, you have the option to do federated learning, which is also a, a typical uh, sort of privacy enhancing technique for, uh, for, for AI systems. Um, well, these are sort of yeah, unique strategies when it comes to personal data and, and analytics. Interesting. So as a security pro, it's, it's always kind of difficult to get buy-in sometimes, um, at least kind of. I think that's an understatement because they fear that we're interfering with speed and, and efficiency and what they're doing a lot of the time. So we have to be careful. Do you find that with something like differential privacy, it's particularly tough because of the implications on you know efficiency and accuracy sometimes in terms of what you have to do to preserve that level of privacy? Yes, we're talking about the incentive for engineering teams, right? Um, but the thing with, with privacy is um, and I think that's a good thing, is that legislation can be very helpful. Uh, for example, when it comes to things like uh, purpose binding and certain types of applications, regulations can be really clear about what is prohibited and, and, and what is not. Uh, and also uh, the fines in, in some geos in the world are pretty big when it comes to uh, you know, breaking those uh, breaking those laws, uh, which creates a very powerful incentive for teams to make sure that personal data is is safe the way it is. So I would say that um, because of this legislation, depending of course where you are in the world, uh, the incentive to teams can be stronger than just uh, just security. Well said. Yeah, I mean, that's a good point. And I am really glad to see legislation um, paying more attention to these things. Um, sometimes they're lacking and I'm kind of disappointed. Um, for example, there was a, a recent um, CISA security, secure by design um, article, and it was just um, kind of a mishmash of, of various topics that were you know kind of incoherently um combined but mm -hmm. also didn't didn't explicitly mention threat modeling which i found underwhelming 
But for AI, I think they've been generally on top of things. I've participated in some interesting discussion around that actually at the UN recently. Um, and with all the things that, all the discussions that have been going on in the UN lately, um, at least within the cybersecurity discussions, everyone was aligned that hacking is bad. We need to collaborate internationally, even where we were in, um, um, even where there have been, you know, um, misunderstandings and miscommunication and disagreements and other aspects of, of politics. So yeah, very good point about legislation. It's very good to see. It's obviously super important to have these complex discussions taking place across stakeholder groups um, around the world, uh, various areas of subject matter expertise being involved and drawn upon. So I'm very, very grateful for that. Um, yeah, I mean, it's good to see the incentives aligned as well, coming back to that. I concur. Uh, the thing is still that uh, the expertise required uh, to identify and apply, you know, the countermeasures for data scientists, uh, that's something that, that needs work. Uh, I mean, there are many, many guides out there that tell you what you can do, but how exactly? Uh, we're getting more and more tools, thankfully, to support there, but the expertise um, uh, of engineering teams for privacy enhancing techniques, for privacy by design even, let alone uh, how to protect against machine learning model attacks. Uh, that, that's, yeah, that needs to be a top priority in the coming time too. Apart from, you know, you can standardize things, but you also need to educate and enable people to be able to comply with those uh, with those standards. So we we work to do. Well said. And yeah, I mean, as far as implementing in a program, um, all of that is costly in addition to just difficult um, in terms of just, you know, getting all of that expertise into a project, especially when it really, you know, you have to get actual human beings involved and, and then their, their knowledge, their expertise can be expensive, which is, you know, difficult to startups for sure who lack the funds to really implement something. But even without those funding barriers there there is um there's just a lot it's still not easy it's still very difficult so yeah i mean so cheers to you for solving the the hard problems it, it certainly keeps us occupied right yeah with uh, yeah there's a lot of people working on this indeed and and thankfully so uh but we're yeah like we're just at the uh at the beginning of making this uh you know st standard thing uh, for for engineering teams. Wonderful, wonderful, yeah. And I, I you know, I love that all the you know. Of course, these initiatives have to be open source to get, I think, the right input in. Um. So yeah, I mean, I know we're both avid OWASPers, so the open it's no longer web application security project world world. What did they change it to? But uh, yeah. it's 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 um <laughs> worldwide application security. Right. right. To, uh, instead of uh web application uh security. So uh, and uh, that's a, a, a rightful uh imp imp improvement, of course, of the scope. And OWASP is really a thing. Um uh, really proud of being a part of it. At the same time, uh many of the standards are produced at the SDOs typically, so the standard uh, definition organizations. Um, and I've recently been exploring how we can bridge that gap. So what we've done is we created a liaison, an official liaison partnership between SENS and ELEC, which is the European a standardization organization together with uh, with Etsy, and uh, that liaison role allows OWASP to be at the table of the working groups of Sensonelic, which means that from the sort of the open source way of working, 
OWASP can sort of um, recruit and enable uh, experts to contribute uh, information that feeds right into uh, the, the actual standards uh, that are going to be applied. This takes some getting used to because uh, these standard organizations are not used to initiatives that provide their input in sort of an altruistic uh, way, which means free of copyright and free of attribution. But it is the only way to share uh, knowledge between standard organizations. Many organizations are doing their research, but because of uh, political and economical and also psychological reasons, uh, they want to keep what they um, write uh, to themselves in order to further build on that and use it to extend their brand. I think the only way uh, to collaborate is to, uh, at least to some extent, let go of that and share those insights. I mean, we're talking about knowledge. Knowledge should be free uh, if it's in standards. And we often nowadays get into situations where we want to reuse something that was already in a standard and then we need to paraphrase what we read there in order not to break any copyright laws. And I think uh, that shows that some of the mechanisms that we use to create standards uh, have gone in the wrong direction. And things are the way they are uh, because of reasons and because of, of history. Um, and it's great to explore new ways to to yeah to break through this and it now allows us to get the, the OWASP experts the AI security experts for uh, part of the uh, OWASP AI exchange uh, really virtually at the table of uh, of standardization enabling OWASP to have its influence and its recognition but also to enable those standard working groups to succeed because they are in dire need of expertise when it comes to AI security which is uh, quite hard to find. Well said. Yeah, definitely hard to find. Uh, yeah, cheers to the open open knowledge. Um, so important. And so, one specific concept that comes up in AI and machine learning, security, and privacy is the concept of explainability. So, could you just explain a little bit about what? that is and share some techniques you recommend implementing to achieve it? Uh, explainability is uh, such an intriguing topic. It's often brought up um, when people not per se mean, I want an explanation. They mean, I want to gain trust. I want to trust this AI system. That's often the goal. The explanation is, not often the goal. The exception is when you need to understand uh, what needs to change to get a different outcome. So let's say you're applying for some funding or, or a loan and the system says no, well, then you want to preferably to get some explanation of why and uh, therefore what you need to change in order to, you know, get that law. That's an explanation that is helpful. Other explanations uh, are more to gain trust. And many attempts to provide such an explanation are actually flawed. And the better alternative is to perform tests on an AI model and not to see if you can get any explanations that make sense. Why is this? Well, often these models have uh, a way of looking at the world that is not the way that we look at the world. You can ask for an explanation, but if the system then says, well, yeah, we took your weight and then we multiplied it with your age, divided it by 16, and that is larger than your income, so you're not getting the loan. Um, that's the way the model works, but it's nothing that you know we can work with. As a matter of fact, we would even dismiss this model because of this weird explanation that we don't understand. 
even if tests would show that this model would perform great, better than any human, better than any alternative system. Um, which means that explanations can be uh, deceiving um, because models often work in different ways. There are methods that um, make an attempt. Uh, one method is creating a shadow model. So you create um, a model using a different algorithm based on the input and the output of an existing model. And you make sure that that algorithm is more readable than the existing model. So let's say the existing model is some complex neural network architecture, and then you train the shadow model, which is then a decision tree. And then you can show to people, listen, uh, start with the age, and then it divides that into you know, 65 years and older, and then for that category, and then you can break down how it makes the decisions. Uh, often, it's, uh, the shadow model is uh, much less accurate because the algorithm is, is, doesn't allow the detailing that the original algorithm uses. Second, often the, uh, the shadow model reasons in different ways. So you're not getting a real explanation of how the original uh, model reasons, just an approximation. And third, again, uh, the way the model reasons is not how people reasons. People create concepts uh, that resonate with the normal frame of reference. Uh, machine learning models don't have to do that. They build their own world when they are training, which makes them simply harder to understand. So explanation there is also a, a big challenge. Another approach is called sensitivity analysis, where you're trying to change little parts of your input to see how it affects the output. And that allows you to identify what parts of the input uh, play the biggest role. So if this is about a loan application, uh, sensitivity analysis can tell you that, wait a minute, if you change your income a little bit, then you would get the loan. Uh, and on images, it would show the parts of the image that the are most important for the model to make uh, decisions. A famous example is where um, a model was trained to distinguish between wolves and huskies. And uh, this model was working really well. And when they did sensitivity analysis, they learned that uh, the model looked at the background and not at the, at the animal itself. And the reason is that uh, the model had noticed that the pictures of wolves were always taken in the snow. So it just looked at the background and if there's snow, it would say it's a wolf. So this shows that some of that sensitivity analysis can be helpful in validating uh, the model. But to use this as an example, a better test set, you know, with mixed uh, wolves and huskies pictures in, in different uh, situation would help you to gain trust in this model instead of just an explanation. So in summary, explanations, uh, if they are required to gain trust, then I would suggest, you know, create a test set uh, or validate the test set and look at the test results carefully because there are multiple ways in which you can measure how good a model actually is. Many sort of uh, performance metrics available and they need to be uh, in line with uh, the business case. That's a complex uh, matter. And uh, if the goal of the explanation is to understand what needs to change, you can use sensitivity analysis uh, to, uh, to do that. Wonderful. Yeah, and that's a really, really interesting example with the wolves versus huskies, because you, you, know, you have to, at the end of the day, ask the right questions. Um, it all feeds in, and the concept of sensitivity anal analysis is not new or specific to you know modern domains it just applies to really any sort of solid testing methodology so yeah great great points um yeah i really really value your, your insight on that because people throw around these buzzwords when it comes to talking about ai um without really getting into the nitty-gritty of what they could entail um and how to how to implement it so again with the the sharing of knowledge and just the importance of that um with the black 
black box models. Wonderful. So, I mean, also, so talk about input output. Do you by chance have um, a strong opinion about your, your favorite functional programming language? I'm just curious. <laughs> My favorite functional uh, programming language? Yes. Uh, I, I don't have any. Okay, so you're just the generalist. You, you just do it all. Very impressive. Yeah, I feel like um, it, here at Moon, uh, there are a lot of strong pre preferences about, for example, a specific dialect of Lisp or a um, or Haskell, but a generalist is just um, you know, kind of the god of programming and and. Um, yeah, if if I tell you what I have the most experience in, you would uh, dismiss me as a programmer. But uh, what is it? <laughs> it's uh, so I started in assembler on a, on a on a Z eighty um, back in the nineteen eighties, uh, which was I guess a terrible way to start programming. Uh, then on to uh, BASIC, which was sort of the main thing in home computers uh, those days and also later in, in, in PCs. Turbo Pascal uh, and Delphi were really popular in, in, in those times. Uh, the uh, did a lot in C++, uh, did uh, a lot in Visual BASIC. Don't shoot me. <laughs> But uh, it, it was a lovely environment to program in Visual Basic because of the, not just the visual way, but also the quick prototyping and the fact that it was an, an uh, interpreter language, which allows you to, which allows a style of programming that's very much trial and error because of the quick feedback loop of, of changing things and being able to just simply continue the program that you're working on. Uh, it's, looked, it's looked down upon uh, but uh, it also had its, uh, its, its, its benefits, really. And then uh, C-sharp and uh, lately mostly, mostly Python, as, as, as many of us, right? Oh, yeah. Um, the machine learning libraries are just amazing. And <laughs> so uh, Next to Rosalma, I forgot to mention it. I, I was programming uh, an, an IBM mainframe with with RPG, and that was also in the 1980s. And at Software Improvement Group, we're we're still encountering systems <laughs> developing that ancient language. So some of those languages uh, seem to be never never going away. How about you? Lately mostly Python because I've been mostly scripting um, and it's just so easy and, and simple um, lab libraries for everything I think uh, really everything that that I've that I personally have been doing lately um, or at least most of it within blockchain can be done in, in, in Python um, well maybe half more than half probably actually right now um, with mid machine learning definitely mostly Python. Um, it's just all kind of readily made. I've been dabbling in Haskell more, Haskell and learning more Agda, um, but I haven't been using that extensively. That's been more kind of experimental and research-based right now, but I know that our team, our team members use a lot of Haskell, or some of them, um, and some use um, Gerbil Scheme, which is a flavor of Scheme that was developed by a friend of our chief scientist, and our chief scientist has been a core contributor as well. I, I contributed to the docs, but that's you know pretty much the extent of that so far for me. But it's um, it's a very nice. I mean, in general, Scheme, I guess, kind of makes sense, if you will, and is interesting. So. But I, I, I'm well aware that it's not very common, um, especially now, but it, 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 it's functional. <laughs> Quite literally, it's functional. Um, but yeah, so, but it's interesting to, to see the parallels, especially when you're thinking about security 
um, I know when you're thinking about something from the adversarial point of view, you're thinking about um, ethical hacking, you're thinking a lot about security through obscurity, for example. But when you're thinking about the security of a given programming language, you want to think about security through clarity, which sounds like the opposite. And I suppose it kind of is, but being able to, to specify exactly what you're doing, um, apply formal verification, um, and, and various checks, um, especially when it comes to blockchain and you know, AI as well, being able to properly prototype and um, uh, you know use a prover such as such as Agda. Um, I find and and, and um, the tooling is getting more and more extensive. I recently, I I only recently realized, for example, that you have an in browser version of Agda. So you don't even need to install it. Um, so, and, and those little things just make the developer experience so much easier. Um, it really improves things now, especially when it comes to, if you're just prototyping, do you necessarily want to deal with all the dependencies and system maintenance and everything? I mean, that's, I mean, if you think about it, when you're just exploring something, do you really want to deal with all those security risks? <laughs> Um, I mean, when you actually have to do these things and, and not just um, for the purposes of learning or, or, or um, doing research, then, you know, it's hard enough. It's, you know, it means enough to kind of avoid those things. But especially when you're doing research, um, the more you can do with, with um, those practicing and learning and playground tooling is just um it says a lot um, that brings, I'm me, sure that that old... brings me to so, hmm? sort of uh, an observation and i'm interested in in, in your, your view into the, uh, into this so experimental environments where you're doing research and trying things uh, especially machine learning um, those environments uh, often suffer from um, yeah, software engineering issues, lack of documentation, lack of testing, lack of um, maintainable code, because the goal is to get a working model or a working system, uh, and that's it. And the assignment typically is not create a system that can be easily maintained and transferred to another team. Uh, and this is what we see a lot when we work with, uh, with clients who are, have AI initiatives, so sort of this this academic lab like programming, and it's not per se the language. It's more how they are are used, um, and it's like um, sort of normal software engineering best practices don't apply for data scientists. Not because they're stupid or anything, but it's just the way they are managed and the way they have been educated, focusing on delivering a, a working model. But sort of yeah ignoring, if you will, uh, uh, what, what also needs to happen, which is uh, create a scalable, reliable, secure, uh, uh, yeah, maintainable system. H have you also seen this happening? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think, you know, the, the way you talk to researchers is definitely um, different. Um, I've, I've been involved in kind of research computing, the research computing realm. And the way you talk to that about security or really a a anything or um, handle system administration, for example, is very different than in a production environment for these reasons. Um, you know, maybe, so because even the research computing that I've done has not been within academia, I've definitely had to be more creative um, than I have for production oriented projects just because um, it's, you know, um, th there's no clear path and it's not really an existing job, even at universities. It's, it's you know, um, the role of research computing facilitator is relatively new and now there are working groups around it. But especially when you're doing it on your own, you just rely on what 
those people are those experts in that niche area are saying and then you try to apply it uh without nearly as many resources as a the university would have although they also lack funding lack resources you know in their own ways it's just um kind of get a little bit creative but especially when you're building systems from, from the ground up that involves the researchers and the r d of behind the project the product it, it's it, it, it's interesting and yes it's definitely different um yeah so yeah I'm so curious. we're almost out of time i see um so we yeah. this is uh thank you very much for 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 inviting me and having this chat thank you and yes uh, keep in touch and thank you again.